Okay, now on with the introduction of our distinguished uh, panelists today. Uh, today's first panelist is Paul Allen Beck, a distinguished professor of social and behavioral sciences at The Ohio State University, where he has been a professor of political science since 1987. Paul, that's 25 years. Um, <laughs> I don't need to remind you, do I? Um, his research and teaching focus on voting behavior, political parties, and political communications in the United States and uh, cross nationally. He has heard frequently on NPR, particularly as we get closer to November. Welcome, Paul. Our next pa panelist um, is Colleen Marshall, who is co-anchor of NBC4 at 5, 6, and 11, and host of The Spectrum. And when she's not doing that, she's practicing law at Porter Wright, Morris, and Arthur. Uh, my colleague, Colleen Marshall. She won many awards, including the Regional Emmy Award for Fight for Ohio, which previewed in 2004 presidential election. Welcome, Colleen. Next, uh, Jennifer Bruner. Familiar name to all of you, I'm sure. Career has focused on election law, both in the public and private sector. She has held elected positions as judge with the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas from 2000 to 2005, Ohio Secretary of State from 2007 to 2011. She is currently at the law firm of Bruner Quinn, a firm she founded in 1988. Welcome, Jennifer. And I'm pleased to introduce Herb Asher, our moderator for this afternoon. Currently the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs and Professor Emeritus of, the political, sci of political Science at Ohio State University. L needless to say, he knows politics. He also is frequently called upon as an expert political analyst by local and national media. Welcome, Herb. Good to be here. There's your panel. Okay. Rich, I thought you were going to mention that uh, we are so blessed today to have on his first day of retirement, Steve Stover is here, and on his first day of retirement, he managed to set the alarm for 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, put, a, put a suit on, and came to this program. Steve, Steve, get a life. <laughs> uh, we're, we're all pleased to be here, and obviously we'll leave lots of time at the end for uh, uh, Q&A. Uh, if you notice, the, the topic really allows for a discussion of anything and everything because it's contemporary questions about politics or whatever. Uh, and so what I thought I would do is lead the discussion by bringing up some topics but then really opening it up to whatever kinds of interests and concerns that you have. And uh, having just uh, all of us experienced uh, uh, the enlightening ex well, experience of, of the Florida primary, uh, again, in, in these primaries, the real winner is always the local TV stations <laughs> and the consultants <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know one, of, one of my questions actually will be, will, will Ohio actually uh, be able to enjoy the same financial benefits Will Ohio's uh, television stations? But let me start off here with a, a general question here, and and, uh, and th that question is: Is the Republican battle over? And then let me add, ask various variations of that question: uh, Will the Ohio primary be important? How might super PACs affect the nomination battle, and perhaps the ability of Newt Gingrich to keep on? And then what about changes in the Republican uh, Party's delegation, delegate allocation rules? Because they really have changed their rules. Might these le lengthen the, uh, the process? And then a question that uh, really could be for Paul, but, uh, uh, and for myself, you know, could we imagine a scenario in which we could see a brokered convention? And the only reason we even mentioned that, that is that that would be the full employment act for political scientists. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Paul, why don't we start off with your comments about the, uh, Florida and what it means for going forward, and particularly for uh, the Ohio primary. Well, I should start by saying that I've predicted a broker convention every four years for many years and have been wrong in that. I think the chances of that this year are higher than they have been in the past, but still not very high. Uh, Romney obviously emerges out of Florida with a big victory. Florida is not in many senses a southern state. And so what he's demonstrated is that his pulling power within the Republican Party is outside of the South, not in the South. 
he goes now to a string of contests in February that is dominated by caucuses, and there are four of them coming up in the next couple of weeks. And then we go all the way until the end of February when there are two primaries, both of which he should win, actually. Uh, one is in Arizona that has a substantial uh, Mormon population, uh, but also a substantial conservative base as well. The other one is his home state of Michigan. Uh, the caucuses between here and now are pretty much Romney country as well. Gingrich, though, seems determined to hang on, as at least does Santoro. Uh, and of course, it's the question of who is the anti-Romney candidate, and that may vary from state to state. Uh, Santorum, I think, doesn't really have the money to continue, and one might look for him to drop out along the way. Uh, Gingrich, in some ways, doesn't need as much money as a candidate who is less well-known to voters, and also seems to be determined to do in Romney. Uh, and there is that bitterness between the two of them, and I, I actually expect Gingrich to hang on for a long time. If he can hang on until March, things turn a bit more favorable for him. The Super Tuesday primaries in early March, including Ohio, uh, have some southern states in them where he should do well if things remain as they are right now. Uh, and those are Tennessee, Georgia, his home state. Georgia selects, by the way, the most delegates of all the states in the Super Tuesday primaries, more than Ohio. Uh, and uh, you know, then going on beyond that, uh, things I think get a little tougher for Gingrich. And so his strategy has to be to hold on until early March. Uh, what we need to remember amidst all this coverage of these primaries and caucuses is that Romney right now only has, or has less than 10% of the delegates he needs to get the nomination. Hardly any delegates have been selected. And it is, in the end, the delegates voting at the convention who determine who the party's presidential nominee is going to be. They don't necessarily have to vote for the candidate that they are, are representing, though they, they, they typically do. So I'll stop at that point. There's plenty more to talk about, but uh, I'll leave it to others. Any, what, anything about super PACs and Republican uh, Party rules this year that people want to talk about? If I can, uh, I just coincidentally was in Florida last Friday shooting another story and I took the opportunity to stop by and interview the chairman of the political science department at the University of Florida. He's been very tuned into the election down there and of course I asked him about the influence of super PACs and he said throughout that hotly contested Republican primary season, from what he observed, he saw only one commercial that was not funded by a super PAC and they were blanketing the airwaves. And what, what I actually had Mr. Paul Beck on my show a few weeks ago, and we talked about the influence of these super PACs. They're totally unregulated. They don't have to say where their money's coming from. No one has to put their name at the end of the commercial and say, I stand by this message. So basically, they can freely say whatever they want and you will not see a super PAC funded ad probably from either party that's not negative. Because what the super PAC fund allows them to do is go after the candidate they don't want. They can do things that the candidate they do want cannot do. They can go, they can make a personal attack. And I know it sounds counterintuitive for somebody who works at a television station, but this super PAC power, I, I think it's one of the worst things that's happened to the political system in a long time, and maybe I'm alone on that. But yeah, you know. I think we should know where the money's coming from, who's funding the message, and what the message truly is trying to tell us. Be sure to send a thank you note to the US Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> I can probably talk a little bit about super PACs. I mean, Romney's super PAC raked in 23.6 million and he has 20 million on hand. And um, one of the reasons I think Gingrich is able to hold on as long as he is is because he's trying to run more of a populist grassroots campaign, even though there's a, there are plenty of super PAC expenses that are being used to support his candidacy as well. But to make sure that you understand, a super PAC can actually use corporate dollars 
and as long as they're not coordinating with a candidate for or against a candidate, then they can actually make political statements that go over the line to say either support this candidate or don't support this candidate. And unfortunately, what we saw with like Let Ohio Vote last year, I'm, I'm not trying to mix metaphors here, but if, if companies want to be able to hide their contributions, they can, there, there can be a nonprofit set up and the contributions can be paid to the nonprofit, then the nonprofit actually contributes to the super PAC. And then we have even less idea of who it is who's actually behind these ads that are either supporting or opposing a particular candidate. The ones who are really making out are the political, the political consultants right now, the media consultants and the media buyers who make a certain percentage off of the time that's bought. But um, I, I keep thinking that you know, the, the American people starting with Occupy Wall Street are looking at this and saying this is just sickening and so because of the ability of the internet and the greater use and the greater access to the internet you're going to be having voters looking for more authenticity in the process which is probably why Newt has been able to hold on for as long as he has in addition to the fact that he's well known but I think people people get tired of the campaign season and the super PAC problem isn't going to go away unless and until there's some kind of uprising or more likely the Supreme Court would treat this like the Dred Scott decision and decide it's a bad idea. Of course. Can you turn it up and you can't hear it back? Okay. Of course, I think Newt also, I think, did, did benefit by two separate $5 million contributions from a wealthy Las Vegas family, uh, but again, those, those monies were totally independent of anything that the Gingrich campaign uh, would have control over or whatever. It, it, it does say something about our campaign finance laws, which we could have a discussion about later. Paul, could you say something more about the Republican delegate selection rules and how they're a little different this year and how that might perhaps extend the process? Let me say something first in terms of super PACs. They're, they're a new player developed first in 2010, and then they're really coming into full flower in, in, in 2012. Candidates like them because they indeed are a source of campaign funds that normally, as we have seen, attack their opponents. Even though candidates have no, quote, control, end quote, over them, they typically are staffed by people who have been very close to the candidates. And so the candidates, I think, can, can trust them more than the other big player in campaign finance, and that's independent committees that are financed typically through these 501c contributions, which do not have to be disclosed, and are going to pour millions of dollars, probably not into the presidential campaigns. They'll do some spending there. But that money is mostly going to be spent in the congressional campaigns. And it probably will total hundreds of millions of dollars. And so we haven't quite seen them yet there's another shoe to fall, I think, as we go down the road here. Uh, it also, if you don't like super PACs, you're going to like the, the uh, independent committees even less uh, because they're going to be even more negative and there's going to be even less disclosure of, of, of who is behind them. In some cases, it's single individuals who are financing them to the tune of, of millions of dollars. Now, in terms of the rules, the, the Republicans and the Democrats both this year decided that they really didn't want to have a repeat of 2008. When you will remember, the primaries and caucuses were front-loaded. The contest took place very early, February and March. Super Tuesday four years ago was the first Tuesday in February. Super Tuesday this year is not as big as it was four years ago, and it's the first Tuesday in March. Four years ago, half the delegates were selected by mid-February. This year, half the delegates will be selected by roughly the end of March. And so there's been a backloading of this. Now, how did they accomplish this? Well, they accomplished this by saying, basically, and the Republicans were, were, are the ones we're focused on here, if you have your contest before April 1st, we will penalize you by cutting your delegate total in half. That's why Florida had only 50 delegates rather than the 100 it would have deserved ordinarily. And we are going to force you to run your contests by proportional representation rules. Now, proportional representation means roughly 
you get the percentage of delegates depending on the percentage of the vote you get. They're not winner take all. Now Florida got an exemption from that. Florida was winner take all. Ohio has gotten sort of an exemption from that. In Ohio's case, if a candidate wins over 50% of the vote in the Ohio primary, which is going to be very important this year, I think, uh, that candidate can take essentially all of the delegates, at least all of them that are up for grabs in, in, in that contest. But what proportional representation means as it plays out in the caucuses and the primaries between now and April 1 is it's going to fragment the delegate counts and it means the candidates are not able to do what John McCain did in 2008, and that is by coming in first, take home almost all the delegates from that particular state. And so that also, I think, will prolong the race beyond what it ordinarily would be. Yeah, if, if you do the arithmetic, uh, and Florida did get an exemption, so it was winner take all, so Governor Romney got all 50 delegates, which again, was a reduced number because Florida had an earlier primary. It would have normally been 100. But if it had been proportional allocation, uh, Governor Romney would have had something like 23 or 24 out of 50. And Gingrich would have had 17 out of 50. And even then, with that same impressive popular vote margin that Governor Romney got, the delegate allocation would have been so split that, in fact, it wouldn't have given uh, Governor Romney quite the advantage that the winner-take-all did. And what Paul's saying is that, in fact, uh, up through April 1st, there's going to be a lot of proportional uh, allocation, assuming that, in fact, uh, uh, Gingrich stays in the race and really con continues the contest. Let's shift gears let, let now. Let me quickly so, add one last thing that I just thought about, and that is that, that conventions can do what they want to do in terms of the rules. The convention could decide to restore Florida's delegates. The convention could decide to scrap the rules that the Republican National Committee had set up following the instructions of the 2008 convention. And a lot of that will have to do with what the delegate counts are and who needs extra delegates to be able to gain the nomination. And so you can almost expect over the course of the summer, uh, if Romney doesn't have quite enough, to see a real struggle over do you restore some of these delegates, and you'll remember the struggle back from 2008 between Obama and Clinton over just these delegate counts themselves. Okay, let's, let's shift gears and let's talk a little bit now about some of the controversy and political battles dealing with the voting process in Ohio and voter ID requirements, early voting, things like that, prospect for a referendum. Uh, Secretary of State Eusted's call for a repeal of legislation to avoid a referendum. Uh, tell us where we are. Wh what really are the issues at stake here? Let's start with the, the former Secretary of State. Well, I'm, I'm smiling at State Representative John Carney because um, most of the discussion appears to be in the legislature. Um, Secretary Eusted suggested last week that perhaps the thing to do would be to go ahead and repeal House Bill 194, which is already subject to a, a, a voter referendum that's set for this fall. Um, his initial, his initial uh, basis for that was to say that, uh, there, that th it would create confusion this fall if we're voting on what the voting rules are. And uh, I, I respectfully disagree with that point of view since um, the, the benefit of House Bill 194 being on the ballot uh, is that it actually maintains virtually the same set of voting rules that were in place in 2008. And what I can tell you, having administered a presidential election and worked with the 88 county boards of elections, what the election officials are looking for is just tell us what the rules are as Secretary of State, tell us what we need to do to carry out those rules and let us do our job because we're directly on the ground in the trenches making sure that each individual voter has the opportunity to have access and to be able to vote. So when you have this specter of, of changing rules, because as soon as you talk about repeal of House Bill 194, then the concomitant issue is going to be, well, what can we put in its place? And to fathom even that you would have different rules in the general election than you have in the primary election is a disservice to everyone involved. First of all, to the voters. Second of all, to the election officials from the precinct workers on up to the Board of Elections officials. And also to the folks in the Secretary of State's office. Because you know, I understand that perhaps Bill Seitz is revive, reviving a proposal 
that I had helped broker with, with him and Dan Stewart at the end of 2010 that unfortunately they couldn't get enough juice in the legislature to get passed. But even, even that, even if you could get Democrats and Republicans to coalesce around what we considered to be a worthwhile proposal, the, the, the difficulty of trying to, to turn that ship when you're already halfway on the journey to where we need to be going to, to have Ohio play a vital role in deciding the election. Um, so the, the position that um, folks that I've been working with on the referendum is simply just hold on, let's deal with what we have in front of us, let's not make major changes because Frankly, we know how to make it work, and then we'll deal with it after the election. And that's pretty much what Secretary Husted has been saying as well. I think he would like a little cleaner slate, but on the other hand, when you have 500,000 people who sign a referendum petition to tell the legislature that it's overreached and what it's done in affecting people's ability to do the very basic thing of democracy, which is to vote, um, I, I don't know that you can really take that away from the people. From my standpoint, just trying to explain to people voting rules has become nearly impossible because it, you know, we try to maintain like a website, what you need to do, what identification you need. It's confusing for people. It's confusing for reporters. I know it's confusing for elections officials because it seems to change all the time. You know, it, it, instead of just saying to voters, show up with some identification, know where your polling place is, instead now we've got these layers of the rules that are changing constantly. And the other thing, the side issue to all of this is Ohio is becoming a citizen-backed referendum state. The success of Senate Bill 5 was overwhelming for the people who put that referendum up there. And so now you have all these independent groups who think the way to change policy in Ohio is just take it to the ballot, get enough signatures, write it in an acceptable way and take it to the ballot. It's why we're seeing the effort now for the personhood amendment, these voting rules amendments, and I think we're going to, I mean, I don't think we'll become a California type state where there's a referendum um, in every county, but, but I think that Ohio is moving more toward that, and I, I honestly think from my perspective of just dealing with the average voters, they're just simply confused. You couldn't go out on the street now and get someone, uh, an average voter, to explain the voting rules to you because they don't understand it. They just want to go vote. And all of this bickering and the, the partisan infighting over the way these rules should be written just adds to the confusion, I think, for the average voter. Can I add sure, that? Sure. The, the bottom line is that there, it, it should be sacrosanct. When we're talking about the voting rules, we should be talking about what is the absolute fairest way that we can do this because if you, if you tilt the playing field one way or the other, you're not really winning because if you have to cheat to win, which essentially is if you start messing with the rules so that it benefits one party or another, you're, you're not really winning. And there's where you end up with the voter frustration, then you add to that the difficulties that we have with redistricting and reapportionment. And then you get the overreaches, like where people try to take the shortcuts instead of everyone agreeing that the, that the most important thing that we can do in a democratic system is to make sure that anyone who's eligible is able to have access and to be able to vote. We certainly don't want people voting who aren't entitled to vote, but we've seen that that's not really a significant problem, but we'll include the safeguards. But there, there, there has to be a middle ground if people will step up who are on either side of the aisle and say, where can we find the common ground? And, and, and the most important thing to remember is take it from the perspective of the voter. Take it from the perspective of what it's like to walk into the polling place and to be able to vote. And if you keep that in mind, you can't go wrong. We talk a lot, by the way, about American exceptionalism. And, and another way that the United States is exceptional compared to democracies, established democracies around the world, is the extent to which our rules change and are complicated for voting. Uh, most countries, most democratic countries, long established democratic countries, uh, have rules that have been very much settled upon and there's really no question about qualifications. Uh, in the United States, we're going through a period in many states, including Ohio, but some states even more than, than Ohio, where indeed we are changing the rules. Ohio, I think, and Jennifer would know this better than I did, I do, uh, had in, in 2008, I think 300,000 provisional 
ballots? Is that how many were, were questioned and had to be resolved after the election? Uh, I think we led the nation probably in, in those kinds of ballots. And, and of that, ballots. 80, over 80% over were fine, which meant it was extra time, extra anxiety, extra difficulty for the, for, for the voter and the poll worker, and it was unnecessary. Colleen, you, you had mentioned you know, various issues going to the ballot, and I want to do that as a segue into the Constitutional Modernization or Review Commission, but uh, it is the case, and you didn't mention, but I guess there's, what, two groups with perhaps marijuana amendments mm -hmm. or laws for the ballot. We've even had people at Ohio State who are so anti-smoking that they've actually talked to us and said, oh, maybe we should put either a referendum or an amendment on the ballot to raise cigarette taxes uh, to, uh, to uh, help fund smoking cessation programs. And when you say to them, is that a proper use of the Constitution, they don't care about that. So one of the issues that's out there right now is the question of uh, modifying, modernizing the Ohio Constitution. Uh, and certainly Speaker Batchelder and Representative Sykes have been leaders in this proposal. And right now they're simply selecting a commission selecting the membership, but uh, uh, what can you tell us about the kinds of items that might be considered by the commission, about the process, what happens at the end, and all of that? Well, you, you mentioned medical marijuana. Strangely enough, there are two issues. Isn't that, John, are you familiar with that? Two separate issues that voters might have to decide on medical marijuana. It's like, well, can't you guys get together and figure that out in one ballot issue? So it's not just, you know, these constitutional issues, but when you look at it, Ohio's a state that constitutionalized a monopoly for casinos. So we've already used the Constitution in ways that were traditionally left for legislative processes. And so I think you're going to see more of this, and the commission you're talking about, then I think you're going to see a battle about, okay, who makes up the commission? Which party has more influence on the commission? And should it be the party that, that holds power at, at the state well, house? They, they, we can, the, if you, if, I don't know if people realize, but every 20 years there has to be a question on the statewide ballot on whether or not to hold a constitutional convention. The last time the state actually held a constitutional convention to do an overall review of the Constitution was 100 years ago in 1912. And if you've ever read any of the transcripts from that, it was a pretty lively time because I've, I've read them in some of my legal research. And so when you go back into the, the late 60s, um, when it looked like that there could be a move toward a constitutional convention, there was a similar movement like this, and this is something that Mike Curtin has been very interested in, and I had talked to him before I left office about this, but the idea of this Constitutional Review Commission is to sort of stave off uh, this sort of grassroots expected need from whether it would be the Tea Party or the Occupy Wall Street folks mm -hmm. to get in there and really dabble with the Constitution in ways that we might regret later on without a wider participation of, of people being involved. So the, what happened in the 60s was that they came up with a series of proposals. They actually had agreement bipartisan in the legislature to put these issues on the ballot so that by the time it came to the question of the Constitutional Convention, that people realize well, we've already solved these problems and we've done it in a very civilized fashion. So you can expect that this review commission may not be to the point where they can put the issues on the ballot this fall. Maybe they will be able to, but they'll at least be able to say to the voters of Ohio, we have come together, Republicans and Democrats, and this is what we think would be best for Ohio. So we'll move forward with it, but we don't think that you need to turn this into a, a, an entire grassroots statewide effort where we might not be able to control the direction that it goes. Well, excuse me. Among the issues that the commission will in fact address will be redistricting. Uh, it'll certainly, re uh, I think, address term limits. It'll probably address the question of how much should we allow citizen groups to go to the ballot to legislate or amend the Constitution and the conditions under which that happens. Uh, but there could, in fact, be a much broader agenda, and I think they're actually looking for suggestions from interested parties what other aspects of the Ohio Constitution need change. And, and you're quite right. The, 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 pro the process, by doing it this way, uh, you head off a constitutional 
uh, convention, and, and in fact, that will be on the ballot. It will be. So, so in November, the question will be asked of Ohio's voters, and again, this is in the Ohio Constitution, it's asked every 20 years, shall we hold a constitutional convention? And every newspaper will encourage voters to vote no. And they'll say vote no because they don't know how the constitutional convention will be run and who will dominate it. Or so, as Jennifer said, they'll, they'll be worried about all sorts of crazy things happening, so they'll say vote no. But now they'll also be able to say we have an alternative mm -hmm. for this commission. And it will be balanced, presumably partisan. So what other kinds of issues might, might, might be addressed on, on a commission like this? You know, one I think of, and it, it comes out of the, the budget struggles that, that uh, local governments are going through right now, is that we have a governmental structure at the local level that is roughly 200 years old. Uh, and it's very much outmoded. Uh, I was reminded of that when I was quizzing my neighbors as to who I should vote for for township trustee. A, I didn't even know we had a township trustee. I <laughs> found that out. Uh, B, none of my neighbors knew any of the candidates for that office. Then I began to ask, well, what does the township trustee do? Nobody knew that either. Now, again, I'm not here to, to criticize township trustees, many of whom, maybe all of whom, do fine jobs. Uh, on the other hand, we're in an era where clearly there is not the kind of money available to be able to do all the things in government that we had done just a few years ago. And one place to look might be to some kind of streamlining of governmental structures at the local level and whether there might be money to be saved. There are governors talked about that, you know, having, having various jurisdictions sort of combine their efforts uh, school boards and, and others uh, where they have, have common challenges. Uh, that may or may not be a good idea, but I think that's very much in the air, and it's something that probably ought to, ought to be talked about as we think about the Constitution. You know, okay, one of the issues are... that emerged when, during the gubernatorial election was just what he mentioned about, you know, Ohio still basically has a system that was deemed unconstitutional for funding schools. And you look at how, you know, how many of us have had levies on the ballot repeatedly in the districts in which we live, and, and people are looking at the structure, the way, the way the system was structured for education in this state is you have a lot of districts that have layers of administrative personnel, which is something that John Kasich talked about extensively when he was running for governor, that you know, if you could consolidate some of these districts, do we really need, you know, Westerville and, you know, the neighboring districts and to everybody to have their own superintendent, their own board of education, their own, their own, you know, why don't we consolidate even something as simple as buying tools for the school, purchasing computers, purchasing paper, whatever, you know, if, can we not consolidate these districts together so that they don't function in what is viewed by some voters as, as a wasteful way. I, I think districts, I know people who work in school districts who are trying very hard to cut their budgets to the bone and, and they are very conscious that they are dealing with taxpayer funds, but the system itself is set up for multiple layers of processes that are repeated over and over again in neighboring districts that maybe if there was some consolidation. We don't have the traveling issues. We aren't going by buggies and horses from district to district like we did when the education system was originally structured. So maybe there are some answers that might be addressed in any kind of a constitutional convention. Uh, we are running out of time and we, now let's turn it to our, our audience to ask any questions they might have. And we have a microphone. Yes. Hi, my name is Martha Trout. I want to put before you a frustration of mine. I see in these primaries that we're experiencing now, I see that the early voting states are influencing who is going to run. And it may be, it might be possible that someone would be discouraged and dropped out that I would have liked to vote for. On the other hand, um, somebody may get uh, support that I would never in the wide world vote for and would drive me to the other party. And I'm feeling frustrated because Ohio doesn't have any current input on who is going to ultimately run. So then I said, well, what would be wrong with a countrywide primary on the same day? And then immediately it was followed by the thought, no candidate is going to campaign in 50 states at once. 
what is the answer to states having an equal influence on the candidates in a primary? There is no, there is no answer to equal influence. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we all have a lot to, you, yeah. you've struck a note that all of us are concerned about. Well, hi, Martha. Hi. Uh, We're old neighbors. Yes, we are. I used to walk my dog by your house every day. Uh, the, the, the National Association of Secretaries of State has had secretaries um, among the, the 50 states actually working to try to influence the state, the, the national political parties, to hold a series of regional <coughs> primaries. That's a very orderly process um, to no avail, unfortunately. And it's something that in the four years I was in the Secretary of State's office, uh, I know Trey Grayson, when he was Secretary of State mm -hmm. of Kentucky, was working very hard at that. And we just weren't able to convince the political parties to do something that was that logical. I, <laughs> I, I might add, I think the political parties at the national level would like to do something that is more logical. The you problem they is, would they, they would. would. Uh, the problem is, in any particular presidential contest, who goes first? And if you say to Ohio, well, you're not going to go first this year, but in 2016, you get to go first. That may not be so satisfactory to, to Ohioans. The other thing, if I can give a brief for the current system, and I, I'm not a big fan of the current system, but the current system does have a quality to it that does indeed vet candidates. And you, if you were to think of the counterfactual, what if we had had in early January one national primary with all of those candidates running, and that was it? I think we've actually learned a lot during, as, as brutal and as, as negative as it's been in some ways. I think we've learned a lot from the process of candidates having to campaign in different kinds of states, having to actually meet voters on the street as they do in New Hampshire or in the Iowa caucus. And so I think there is a benefit to a drawn out process, even though there may be ways to make that drawn out process better than it is. Does that water down Ohio's influence? Ohio has tried. Remember, we used to have a June primary. We said we weren't very influential. We moved it up to May. We were not very influential. So now we moved it up. And it is the case that the early states have a disproportionate impact and that's, of course, you know, Iowa and New Hampshire. And, and I think the, the issue here is that lots of candidates get winnowed out, and the media play a major role in that winnowing process. So we never get to see some of the candidates, like Governor Pawlenty, who dropped mm -hmm. out when he didn't do well in the silliest of all things, the Iowa straw poll. <laughs> yeah. Next question. <laughs> if I could point out very quickly, the other thing about having Iowa have so much influence, Jim Ganahl always points out to me, Iowa has more hogs than people. <laughs> <laughs> and this state, with just a light population with loosely run caucuses, has a lot of influence on the national elections. It's really kind of silly. Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Rutledge from the law firm of Bricker and Eckler. I'd like to return to the topic of the Supreme Court decision authorizing super PACs. It was mentioned that there's some prospect that Congress might address this court decision. I'd like uh, to return to that subject and ask you to elaborate, and especially whether there's any members of Congress that uh, have given this some traction. I, I, I don't think there's a snowball's chance that the Congress will address it in a serious fashion. but. Some members of Congress, including Republicans and Democrats, have said repeatedly now it's the worst decision ever issued by the U.S. Supreme Court. And John McCain, of course, one of the authors of McCain-Feingold, has been saying that. I don't think there's going to be any. Well, what the Supreme Court said was that the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, in allowing for freedom of speech, uh, simply restricts what Congress can do in campaign financing reform or campaign financing regulations. Uh, the only way to overcome that, of course, is through a constitutional amendment, which I think has the snowball's chance that, that, that Herb <laughs> was you. talking about. What they could do is, and the Supreme Court left this opening, what they could do is require disclosure and require timely disclosure. And the Supreme Court, in writing that decision, said here is an area that doesn't trample or doesn't uh, uh, trample free speech 
rights. Uh, now, the Supreme Court wasn't willing to do it. They don't, they don't do that sort of thing uh, from the bench. Uh, but Congress could indeed do that, but I don't think there's going to be any agreement on that. A lot of people in Congress are benefiting from these super PACs mm. in ways that we may not imagine. And, and Paul mentioned their own people, people who are closely aligned to them, are generally running the super PACs that are raising money against their opponent. So while they don't have any direct contact, and we will, you know, that we know of, that they don't influence directly the super PAC, clearly the super PAC benefits them. So I, I can't imagine that Congress has any incentive to do away with the super PAC system. And the super PAC is basically federal, state, local, because, and, and they, they were allowed to do this as a result of an FEC advisory opinion. And interestingly, uh, both Democrats and Republicans had asked the question at approximately the same time of the, FC, F, of the F, F Federal Election Commission. So the, the idea of a super PAC means federal, state, local. It pulls the reporting away from the locality. So a super PAC that is registered in Washington could actually be involved in a state race but not have to file with the state. Um, so it's, it's, it's abhorrent in a lot of different ways and at a lot of different levels. I might add that paradoxically, it, it's the parties and the candidates who are the most regulated in the current campaign finance system, not independent spenders. And I think the Supreme Court probably is not done in, in dealing with campaign finance. There's a case making its way towards the Supreme Court, I don't know exactly where it is right now, that would deregulate the parties, would allow the parties to spend whatever they wanted to spend and get their money in whatever amounts they wanted to get, uh, and the Supreme Court might be open to that. Again, there are free speech issues that, that arise. And I can tell you a lot of money was spent um, anti-Senator uh, Sherrod Brown in, in the fall. I mean, the election isn't, mm -hmm. wasn't even kind of officially underway for him yet, but a lot of money was spent at local television stations. None of it came from Ohio. Mm -hmm. It was all Thank out of Washington. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Kwapik, and I am a third year student in real estate in the Fisher College of Business at Ohio State. Um, and I actually have a question towards Mr. Asher, um, which is a little bit of a different question. But um, uh, I have a couple, uh, I guess, different views on the sophomore rule um, at Ohio State. And, uh, <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk after. <laughs> Seriously, about okay. housing? Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk after. Yeah, let's, okay, absolutely. Let's not inflict this upon the audience. <laughs> But sophomores should be housed. <laughs> Far away. I <laughs> uh, uh, don't want to follow that whole discussion. But my, my name is David Hull, and uh, redistricting got mentioned a couple of times, but you didn't have an opportunity to go into any depth on it, so I'm going to try to give you that opportunity. Um, obviously, the kinds of gerrymandering that's been going on for centuries, um, you know, has, has created problems for years in states like Ohio and the majority of states that haven't tried to come up with a nonpartisan or bipartisan system for it. Um, some of the ones that I and many people believe are the worst things now is the adding to the partisan nature of the system by you know, each party's primary slanted to the uh, extremes. And also just a system where the candidates pick the voters rather than the voters picking the candidates uh, or the parties pick, pick the voters. So I'll ask the question this way. Um, you know, in, in the good old days, uh, whichever party was in control, you know, did it to their advantage, but they were also concerned about incumbent protection. There was a mix of party advantage and incumbent protection. With improved technology and with increased partisanship, the balance seems to have gone very heavily towards party advantage. And I will ask the question this way, who on the panel has seen a more outrageous <laughs> job of redistricting <laughs> than was done within the last year by the General Assembly for congressional districts and by the reapportionment board for state legislative districts. I have. <laughs> I mean, look, if, if you're asking when you have partisan redistricting, and you're the best person to talk about this, do political parties who control the process typically get greedy and excessive? The answer is yes. 
And the hypocrisy that surrounds us at times is astounding because the Democratic Party had a chance to change the system in Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jennifer and, uh, and well, Paul and other colleagues went are working on trying to change it, and the best time to change it was, is for some people, six years from now. Change it now for six years from now when nobody knows who will be advantaged by the current system. Mm -hmm. But if you're asking, is it as egregious in other states? Those states that have partisan redistricting, mm -hmm. it can be even worse. We, we really had the perfect storm in 2010 because Mary Taylor was not running for re-election. I was not running for re-election. The only, the only sitting member of the apportionment board that was running for re-election was Ted Strickland, um, if he would have won re-election. So that way, it, it really could have gone either way because mm -hmm. with a five-member apportionment board, you have Secretary of State, Auditor of State, Governor, and then two members, one Republican, one Democrat from the state legislature. So knowing that it could go either way, it really was a perfect storm to give everyone the incentive. We held a redistricting competition. We showed working with the League of Women Voters and others that you could draw these lines in a fair fashion where we're even protecting the compactness or the commonality of a community. But it, it, was, it was the Democrats as much as the Republicans that weren't willing to bite the bullet and do it. Um, Secretary Husted worked very hard with both sides trying to make it happen, even if it wasn't his particular proposal, even if it was the one coming from the House, but um, unfortunately it, it didn't happen. You know, the unattended consequences of this as well, I, I think some, some Republicans who, who would have been thought to benefit from this are, are finding that there were um, unintended consequences. T. Berry is being viewed by some people as not being conservative enough, so this <clears throat> might open up a challenge with his, within his own district. Steve Stiver has told me, uh, if you saw his district, it's like an inverted mm -hmm. C. He's now, his, his district snakes through 13 different counties. And he found out, uh, he figured out that 440,000 people are now in his district who probably don't know his name. So he's got a lot of work to do. And, uh, and, but I see Terry sitting there, and I'm going to, I'm, I told him I would try to protect the Republican part of this too. Democrats, as Herb said, could have changed this. John Husted had a proposal when he was in the legislature to change this. They had the power to do it. Neither party wanted to do it because they were both looking forward to that apportionment board election and both thinking we might take control. We might be able to do this. So Democrats would have done the same thing. But the way the system is set up now, you're going to get districts like that. It's ridiculous for him to have to, to think there's a commonality of purpose in a district that snakes through 13 separate counties. Arlington to Athens. Imagine. From <laughs> Athens and far north, west, uh, you know, southwest. I mean, it's it's a huge district that he has to try to to serve their needs when their needs are so diverse and there's no commonality of interest. So. I don't know what the answer is, but this, this I think your political science classes are gonna be studying this map for a long time to come. Yeah, I would add there that that's not the worst problem with, with uh, Gary Mindrain. The, the worst problem is the problem, is the disadvantage it creates for us as voters. Most of us in Ohio and most of the states that have partisan gerrymanders are not going to be voting in congressional or legislative election, elections where we really have much choice going to be overwhelmingly stacked for one party or another. I think that, that these days, gerrymandering does indeed protect incumbents, as well as whatever the majority party is. I'm reminded that Ohio in the, in the 1880s and early 1890s redid its legislative districting every two years. And what it wanted to do when it redid it in that era was create as many competitive districts as it could because it thought that they could win them, the majority party did. Well, we've gone a long ways from that. Now we're basically trying to protect incumbents. Thank you. My name is Danny Robbins. I'm with Nonprofit Evolution. My question is, what happens if the Republican primary does go to the convention and somebody gets voted up from the floor who hasn't been vetted? Wouldn't I'll, that I'll, be a fun convention, though? <laughs> <laughs> All of us would love it. Yeah, I'd be really happy at this table. If you look at history, though, Garfield was actually doing the nominating at the convention, and it was at the convention that he was nominated to run and then became president. So there was someone who actually didn't really want to be president, but 
was nominated at a convention when he was supposed to be doing the nominating. I, I, by the way, think that if no candidate goes into the convention holding the majority of the delegates, and we're really talking about Romney, I think, uh, the convention will go to somebody else. Uh, they almost have to. Uh, and then the Republicans will have the challenge of trying to defend that against an assault from the Democrats, of course, that they are undemocratic. Uh, and you know, back to the smoke-filled rooms, we all remember the 1968, or many of us do, the 1968 Democratic Convention where Hubert Humphrey had not campaigned in any primaries, and yet he won the nomination. Well, that's the last time that happened. Uh, and again, I think that the odds are that it won't happen this time around, but it's more likely to happen this time around than in the ensuing years from 1968. Gene Krebs, today's softball question for the panel is, would you care to talk about uh, the lack of an effective third party in Ohio nationally? What are the impediments to a third party emerging? I, we hear this every four years, Bobby and Betty Buckeye say, why don't we have another choice? so on and so forth, and I see Dr. Beck nodding his head. Yeah, he already has an idea. And, I, and by the way, I agree with you about it. I've always said this for several months now. It will be a brokered convention. I'm sorry. On, yeah. on third parties, um, just like clockwork, the Libertarian Party sues the Secretary of State and says we want ballot access, we want the ability as a political party to go to have our own primary and to be listed on the general election ballot as libertarian you might notice in 2008 the ballot was extremely long for president and you had four four additional parties you had socialist green constitution and um libertarian and and the reason being it was because time and time again the sixth circuit or the federal court below them rules that Ohio's rules for allowing political parties to organize and actually be on the ballot are inadequate and they're excluding the, the parties from being able to have or enjoy the same or similar rights as the, the major political parties. So, um, and again, the legislature has not stepped up and made the necessary changes. It, it, they're there now and Secretary Husted is keeping up that tradition and it's unfortunate the parties had to spend the money to go to court to do it um, but then there's going to have to be some onus on those minor political parties to really get organized and raise the dollars do the kind of grassroots organizing and get you know more visual before the voters of Ohio there's a political science answer to that question and that is a thing called Duverger's law Duverger was a French political scientist who studied electoral systems around the world and basically what he said is that systems el who elect in a district a single person and that person can win the election just by coming in first not by winning a majority but by coming in first they're going to only have two parties and the reason for that is that voters don't want to waste their vote on somebody who is going to come in second or third particularly if by voting for let's say a third party candidate <coughs> the candidate they least prefer of the two major party candidates wins. And so you see that dynamic. And of course, the other thing is that good candidates don't want to waste their careers in third parties. They want to play in the major leagues. They want to play with the major parties. And in fact, the only thing that really could happen, and it could happen in, in, in 2012, is that you wouldn't find third parties getting into the, the, the contest. I mean, there would be some already there, and Jennifer's named what they are. Uh, but you would find very well endowed, financially independent candidates who are running basically by themselves. There's no party connected with them. And we've seen more of that in recent decades than we've seen any kind of, of, of you know, really uh, strong third party movements. And if I can just add candidly from a reporter's perspective, Generally, I try to, to interview the third party candidates. This makes me sound terrible. They're usually a little loony. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's like, well. they come in there with, they, and, and I'm not saying any particular third party, but at the end of these interviews, I'm always saying to myself, I understand why you're on the third party ticket. <laughs> it's uh, just, they're just a little different. Co Co Colleen, I think. I think credit to you, because one of the challenges is that most media would ignore mm -hmm. 
third parties and independent candidates because they would say they're not viable, they can't win. And if they weren't loony and really intelligent and thoughtful, but they were doing poorly in the polls, they probably would not get the same kind of coverage. So I think there's a lot of other answers here, too, about this, but congratulations And of course, to what you. happens in the Metropolitan Club stays in the Metropolitan Club. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, they tweet. <laughs> Do we, Turn off those tweets. Rich, this your Do we have Facebook friends. <laughs> yeah. Jane's telling us, I, I'm sorry, oh, I think we've okay, run out of time. I apologize. Maybe we can get these folks back a little later <laughs> in, the, in the season, as it were. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I'm going to have to, as an old poly sign major, go back and audit some classes. I'm old enough to do that now. I uh, want to invite you all to continue the conversation out in the lobby where we have some coffee and cookies. Before you go, though, I want to thank the Jeffrey Company uh, for sponsoring our event today. Also, our panel, Paul Beck, Colleen Marshall, uh, Jennifer Bruner, and Herb Asher. Thank you very much, panel. It's been terrific. <laughs> sign up for both forums next week and sign up in a hurry. It'll be fun. Thank you all for coming. I love you.